All right, everyone. <clears throat> Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are in the world, I have a bubble in my throat. <laughs> And my name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me today on our Friday Masterclass. And uh, today's video masterclass will be based around working with 360 and VR video in Premiere. It's been quite some time since I've revisited this topic. Um, not that there have been significant changes in the last couple of versions of Premiere, but in realizing the last kind of full series of VR tutorials that I made were somewhere around 2017, 2018. I figured it was just worthwhile to go in and uh, spend a couple of masterclasses really going through all the basics and all the things that we have in there now, um, which were pretty different if you haven't looked at it since we initially introduced VR. So as always, we're coming to you uh, live on Behance Adobe Live YouTube. Great to see you all. Thank you so much for joining. The conversation is happening over at behance.net slash Adobe Live. So I invite you to please join me over there. That's the chat I'll be reading. And as always, great to see everyone. Lots of familiar faces in here. Jan, Eric, Camilla, Ken, Steve, Wade, Cal, Jose. So wonderful to see you. What is happening? Coming to us over here on the other channels. We've got Ben and Samantha and Salim. Great to see you too. Oh, and I just saw a note here from Ken Cauley. Oh, I sure wish Jason does another daily challenge. Well, guess what, Ken? Your prayers have been answered. As a matter of fact, we are starting a full week of video daily creative challenges this coming Monday. Yes, we brought them back, back by popular demand. So uh, this Monday, the 17th, 8.30 a.m. Pacific time, a full week of uh, Premiere Pro daily creative challenges. And uh, Wade and Jan Eric or Tim, who's ever in the chats, if you want to post the, um, the URL for the sign up for that, uh, at least the landing page, all the assets and things for next week will get uploaded there sometime today or tomorrow. So maybe the page isn't ready to quite register yet. I don't exactly remember how that all works. But in any case, go ahead and sign up for that. It's going to be next week. It's all based around storytelling, new content to show you, some vintage content to show you. <laughs> Should be really interesting. Okay, and a lot of fun. Yay! Steve's into it. Jay's into it. Isis, what's up? Cool. Okay. PRDCC. Great. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go over to Premiere Pro. What's up, Win Sakesan? Nice to see you. Okay. Switching over here. And let's get started with some VR. Okay. Now, as mentioned, this is going to be probably part one of two or maybe even three because there's a whole bunch of different things that you can do uh, in Premiere with VR. And then if you integrate After Effects, there's even more things that you can do. Now, we're not going to cover After Effects at all today. This is just going to be based around Premiere. Um, but really, we're going to start from the beginning because first and foremost, it's good to know that there are many flavors of 360 and VR out there. So, uh, And I'm not just talking about frame sizes all different types of formats uh, of, of VR. And not the native format, but what happens after you shoot your 360 immersive video, what you turn it into. And most cameras and or external softwares, you have some option to, say, create you know, an equirectangular version of your VR content or a dome version of your VR content. So there's, there's several different formats and mediums. The one that we're going to be focusing on, and the one that Premiere supports, first note, is equirectangular. So if you're shooting with a camera, the stuff that you see on the left over here, this is some stuff that I shot uh, a gazillion years ago with the uh, Samsung Gear 360. It was one of the first sort of consumery 4K cameras out there. So this was shot in the desert with that. It creates live uh, H.265 files but it had an, a secondary software that you has, had to use. I think it was called Action Director or something like that, that would create the stitched, right? The stitched version with an equirectangular frame. That was the format that you need. And that's the format that you need for Premiere. That's what Premiere understands. So there's lots of cameras out there, lots of formats out there. If you have the option of taking your raw 360 and making it Premiere acceptable, you want it to be equirectangular. And I'm going to show you what unstitched footage looks like too. You can in fact still use VR and edit in VR and play around and view in VR. Um, it's just going to look a little weird if it wasn't properly stitched and actually delivered as an equirectangular version of that. OK. So let's start from the very uh, be beginning here. Jan Eric, there is no VR standard yet. <laughs> Surely you jest. 
standard. No. <laughs> There's no video standard, period, anymore. I mean, now with 8K slowly making its way, 12K, I mean, it's, it's anybody's game. And VR's kind of slowed down a little bit right now, to be completely honest. Um, but yes, there's many formats and flavors, and unfortunately, I think Equi Rectangular is maybe the most common, perhaps Dome second to that, but Equi Rectangular is pretty common, but it, there's, there's no real standard. Okay, so we're actually going to start with that, uh, that desert footage here, shot on the Samsung Gear 360 in 4K. And here's the really cool thing about VR. The workflow, if you know how to edit in Premiere already, it actually doesn't change. There's a couple things you need to be aware of, certain buttons and things you need to enable. But outside of that, the actual importing, creating a sequence, cutting, scrubbing, working with audio, it's all basically the same. So in the case of this footage here, uh, it's this clip that you're seeing here called Leaving Boulders. Just like I would normally do, I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose New Sequence from Clip. Now, part of the reason for that is one, this is just regular 360. So to, fur to further complicate things, there's the concept of monoscopic, regular, two-channel, uh, 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 non-stereo, <laughs> two-channel, monoscopic VR and stereoscopic VR, okay? So this is just standard monoscopic VR, and this is a standard stereo soundtrack. So I don't have any kind of ambisonic or spatial audio attached with this. So I'm simply going to choose new sequence from clip. And when I do that, it builds the new sequence for me. Now, one of the nice things about Premiere is that it has a feature called Auto Aware VR. So when you insert your stitched equi-rectangular footage, it automatically should be able to detect if it's monoscopic or stereoscopic, and then basically turn on the equi-rectangular projection. Now, there's two things you can do to verify that and enable this function. First, you have to make sure that the VR viewer is enabled in your button editor in the program monitor. So here in the program monitor, the button you're looking for is this one here. Now, I don't believe that this is enabled by default, toggle VR display. So to do that, we're going to click on the plus button here to get into the button editor, all right? And then again, you're going to find this little button here, toggle VR video display. And then you're just going to drag that down wherever you want it into your buttons. I've already got mine there, so it's going to stay right there, all right? So that's the first thing, okay? Now, before we even push that, let's make sure that this sequence automatically, automatically detected that this was, in fact, VR content. So with the sequence select, whoops, how did that happen? Selected down here, let's go up to the sequence menu and choose sequence settings. And under sequence settings here, down at the bottom, you should see VR properties. Whoops, went over too far. Sorry, I'm trying to squeeze all this into the view for you here. VR properties. So you can see projection, equi-rectangular. By the way, none or equi-rectangular. Equi That's all we support, equi-rectangular, all right? Horizontal captured view, vertical, so it understands this and it understands the layout, monoscopic. And then there's two flavors of stereo that we support. Over, under, so I'll show you an example of that. If you've seen the raw, clip, it's it literally, it's like you've got each eye on top of one or the other, or the side-by-side -side stereo, okay? Monoscopic, equirectangular, okay. So this is good, it auto-detected. So what that means now is that when I click on the VR video display, now I'm actually viewing in VR, which means that I can simply click inside the viewer here, and I'm seeing what's happening in 360 on this clip, okay? Now, the first thing that people often ask is, uh, how come it's displaying this square? Now, in the 2017 version of Premiere, when we first released VR, hard to believe it's been three plus years, um, this display was in a widescreen window. Well, as it turns out, most of, your, most of your headsets are actually projecting in kind of a square viewer. It doesn't really matter necessarily, right, based on how big it is and the way that they're focused because you're moving around anyway. It's no less immersive. But this was, we retooled this to show off a, a square view based on the experience of, be, of wearing goggles. And mind you, if you have a VR headset connected to your machine when you're in Premiere, you can in fact edit, you can edit in the goggles. I can't do that for you here today, but 
even, you know, you can even see your joystick and like redo things in the timeline. It's pretty cool. Um, but let's talk about how we modify these settings. And by the way, you can see there's little coordinates that we can kind of drag, drag it around here. We can do it via these dials, or we can simply click and drag on the video itself. By the way, we'll get to this in a second, but I also recorded secondary audio with this. Synchronization-wise, it works the same way. All right, Cal, how do people commonly view VR? Special hardware? Well, that's the thing. Um, you know, if you're talking about VR gaming, you've got a headset. If you're talking about VR video, which is supported on YouTube and Facebook and other places, usually it's just like this. And being 360, I use VR a little loosely, you're just panning around in, in 360 degrees. So you don't really, you know, that's the nice thing about it. You don't need any special hardware. The file just needs to be encoded properly when you upload to those respective services. All right. When I was a kid, VR meant using a Viewmaster. Uh, I'm with you there. Been there. Know that very well. OK. So in the program monitor, you will see our traditional settings wrench icon right here. So if you click on that, you notice there's a little section up here kind of dedicated to VR. So the first is VR video settings. So as you might guess, this is related to that VR video viewer. Notice we have, uh, we have it enabled and then showing the controls. If we turn off show controls, that just hides that the, the little um, uh, radial editors there. Gives you a kind of cleaner view. Again, you can still click and drag around. You're just not seeing the handles. It just puts more of the video uh, sort of unobscured in the program monitor. I usually typically leave it on anyway, even though it just takes up a lot of screen real estate having that there. Now, there's two other things here. Adobe Immersive Environment and Monitor Ambisonics. Now, both of these are specifically related to wearing headsets. So first and foremost, if you've got the headset connected and you want to be sort of editing in that way, you enable Immersive Environment. I don't have a headset. I never used a headset. I mean, I've tested one, but I don't own one. I never checked this. Monitor Ambisonics. This was added, I think, in 2018. If you have an ambisonic soundtrack, which we'll get to, along with your 360 VR video, by enabling this, when you're in the headset, as you turn your head while the video is playing, it's following the motion of the ambisonic soundtrack. So you'll actually hear things in spatial position as you move when you're playing back in Premiere. Very, very cool. Now you might be thinking, well, what is it doing normally if you don't have a headset? Well. Again, it'll, you'll hear the changes, essentially, if you're moving stuff around. And we'll get to that in a moment. But the headset, it'll, it'll do it as you're moving. You're, you don't have to move the screen, all right? You turn your head, it's going to do that for you. That's the difference. So if you have a headset, you want monitor ambisonics to be on. This is not ambisonic. We're not going to worry about it for right now. Now, the other thing that you're going to be able to do here inside of the settings Two things. Now, again, this is monoscopic, so we'll get to this stereoscopic view option later. That's why it's grayed out. But the main thing is, if you don't want to be working in that square view, you can change this from, say, 108 by 108 to something like 180 by 90. Okay? And now you have this, you know, sort of two to one ultra widescreen. Obviously, if you want to do a, a standard 16 9 ratio, um, you can do it that way too. Entirely up to you. This is just a viewer. So this, is, this, is not, this isn't changing anything relative to the actual VR content. This is just how it's being displayed in Premiere itself. Make sense? So you could do, you know, theoretically, you know, uh, 160 by 90 as well, right? If you wanted to do that. I think it actually let, let's, in fact, let's see if it lets you input any, any figure in there. It probably does. There you go. Okay. So again, this is a non-destructive viewer. And you can even see there's the 360 camera right there. That's how all this magic was captured. <laughs> it's me driving in my car in the desert. Okay. Got it. All right. Everyone seems to get that. Okay. So now you know. Now you know where these controls are, how to manipulate them. I'm going to go back to the original view for a moment here. All right. And just to kind of point out again, nothing changes here. Let's take this 
audio file called driving. I'm going to drag this into the timeline. So this was recorded with the iPhone while I was driving. By the way, here's just the native sound of the camera attached to my to my car. The desert journey. All right, you see as I'm moving it now. Water. And some kind of uh, some kind of cover. Okay. Let's go ahead and select both of these audio clips. It's going to synchronize, synchronize audio. It shifts them into position. All right, you can see that I actually started recording the iPhone a little before I started rolling video, which is a good thing. So I'm gonna snap these two together. Whoops, drag this all to the beginning, shrink up the, whoops shrink up the video where there's no longer any secondary and now turn off the car audio and then here's my slightly cleaner iPhone audio and some kind of uh, some kind of cover all right this is not ambisonic this is not spatial it's just straight stereo with 360 VR and now you can do whatever you want. You want to cut something, you grab your razor tool, and you cut. All right? You want to ripple, ripple trim, ripple delete, do something like that, you can do that as well. All right? We can do, we can do any of the functions that you're used to doing work exactly the same way. Uh, that's kind of the nice thing about this. It doesn't change the way that you know editing. Now, we're going to get into transitions and things in a couple minutes, but for basic non-stereo, non-ambisonic VR, the process is exactly the same, which is really nice and makes life pretty darn easy, okay? Again, go into the viewer, out of the viewer, viewer, out of the viewer, okay? Simple, no questions, everyone's, everyone's certain of what's happening, okay. Now let's go ahead and create one with some ambisonics and stereo. So we're gonna lump these two things together. Now, Whereas, here's the footage I'm going to use. This was from one of my uh, Adobe colleagues shot a while ago overlooking uh, the, the, um, the Golden Gate Bridge. As you can already see, this is what's known as stereoscopic over under, okay? And obviously, this is, uh, you're kind of seeing this in its raw form, but it's already been stitched, right? Okay, kind of cool. You can see the clouds moving there if you're looking in the end source there. And this also has an ambisonic soundtrack. Okay, this was in fact, I believe, recorded with uh, the Zoom H1, H1 or H2? Now I'm forgetting. H2, H2N, H1N. Oh gosh, I can't remember now. I have this device. Um, the Zoom device in question, I think it's the H2N. Can someone answer in the chat? Does anybody remember? <laughs> it's been a while. It's in a box over there. I can't see it. Um, the nice thing about this device, it's very inexpensive. It records uh, sort of traditional spatial ambisonic four-channel audio, and it just works. It just works really nicely. It's small. You can mount it. Um, it doesn't capture sound from directly above, however. So when you look at the audio file, people have asked me this, you'll see there's four tracks of audio. It's an interleaved file. The third track is blank. That's by design. It's actually not capturing audio in that direction, but it doesn't actually really minimize the spatial immersive effect. Having done a lot of stuff with binaural audio in the past years ago, I'm not super impressed with ambisonics in general. I don't actually, <laughs> well, we won't get into that now. Um, my point is that device records what is around you and it's, it doesn't feel any less immersive, okay? Some, some have microphones that record from all directions. There's a Sennheiser mic that does that brilliantly. It's very expensive, but if you need that kind of sound, go for it. All right. My point is that if I were to simply create uh, a sequence with this content here, just like I did before, new sequence from clip, okay? Now again, auto-aware VR, it still detects the type of video that it is. So if I look at the sequence settings here, you can see equirectangular and oh, it already figured out this is stereoscopic over under. So you might be thinking, okay, perfect, great. And then I turn on my viewer, there it is, okay. And as mentioned before, uh, some of the differences or additional options that you have now when you're working with stereoscopic content is that you can choose your view, left, right, or if you're actually trying to, via some of the effects that we have, manipulate 
the stereo. Readjust the, the stereo effect. You can go into anaglyph mode, and you'll see here this is going to give you that, that classic, you know, if you're wearing the red and blue glasses, um, this is now going to look very, very, very 3D, okay? And it's pretty effective, and it's pretty cool, all right, if you want to work in anaglyph mode, okay? Kind of testing out your stereoscopic content there. Okay. However, there's a problem, and the problem is specifically related to the audio soundtrack, because I told you this one has an ambisonic soundtrack that was simultaneously recorded with it. So if I take this AmbiX file here, and I drag it into my timeline, whoops, and I expand this, okay, we're only seeing two channels. Now, some of you, if you haven't changed the settings that I'm going to show you in a minute, you might see this brought in as four mono stems. In any case, all of those are incorrect. <laughs> There's a specific way that you need to handle the import, and more importantly, um, the sequence settings when working with four-channel ambisonic audio. All right, so the first thing you need to do is actually alter something in the preferences, all right? So we're going to go up to Premiere Preferences, and is it in Timeline? Yes, it is. Okay, got to remember that. So that changed from 2017. I think it used to be in the Audio Preferences. So in, under Preferences Timeline, you'll see there's a thing here, Default Audio Tracks, and this is all about how it handles um, Premiere Pro Audio. The one that you want to modify, I think by default, all of them are Use File. Multi-channel mono media, you want to make sure that that is set to adaptive. So what that's going to ensure is that if you have tracks that are multi-channel, meaning that you have more than a stereo output on your sequence, if you're using interleaved files that say have four channels, six channels, eight channels of audio all in one file, this will allow you to, when you bring that audio in, it's all going to come in as one interlude. It's not going to try and separate them into different stems. It brings it in as it's intended. So this is the first thing you need to do if you're going to be working with ambis ambisonics, is modify multi-channel mono media to work as adaptive, okay? Now, the second thing here is that in order to use this properly, we need to actually create the sequence from scratch. Fortunately, there's a preset for us that has all of that selected. Now, before you do that, again, one of the things to consider is what is the actual frame size of the media that you're working with? So if I just maximize all my content here, uh, right now, this is uh, the perfect example. So I've got three different types of VR in here in three completely different frame sizes. So here's the stereoscopic one, 2880 by 2880. Here's, I'm not even sure what this one is. 3840 by 1920. Is this the Amsterdam? Yeah, so this is this is the raw, unstitched content that I shot on another camera. Here's the Gear 360 stuff. <clears throat> okay. And then here's some 6K. I don't even know what this was shot on. I'm forgetting now. Stuff that was shot in Venice, and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. All right. So we need to know the frame size of the stereoscopic content we're working with because there's different presets that already have those dimensions built in. You can, of course, modify them, but it's good to know in advance. So we're looking for 2880 by 2880, all right? So let's go to the new sequence icon, or new item icon, I should say, and choose sequence. And under sequence presets, you can see I've already kind of pre-selected it for you here. We're going to twirl down VR. All right, and then we're going to twirl down stereoscopic, and then right there you can see there's a preset 2880 by 2880 with ambisonics. Now, is this listing every, every frame size out there? No. These were the ones whenever we made these presets that were the most common. And this one, it's funny, 8192 by 8192. I remember when we put that in there and the first time I saw 8K VR and, you know. <laughs> That's, that's when you go back and you watch how to create proxies, because you're going to want that for 360 and 8K. It, those, those files are massive. In any case, this is what we want. So when you choose this preset, this even tells you right here, within Premiere Pro's timeline preferences, ensure that the multi-channel mono media default audio track option is set to adaptive. 
This will ensure that Ambisonic Audio Media is properly managed, okay? And this tells you all the attributes. So 2997, 2880 by 2880, square pixels, progressive, 48K, equirectangular, stereoscopic, all right? And then all of the adaptive audio tracks. So it's building a sequence with, by default, adaptive audio tracks. Now, if you want to modify any of those settings, go under settings. This is where you can change the frame sizes. So again, you can build your own presets based on what your camera's shooting. And then if you need to adjust the track configurations for audio, again, if you're working specifically with Ambisonics, your master will be multi-channel, okay? Not stereo, not 5-1. And then the number of channels will typically be four, okay? If you're working with Ambisonic, you're gonna want a four channel master. And then you can choose whatever, you know, these are just how many default tracks open by default, three, and they're all adaptive, okay? And then you have a VR setting here, which again, we're just, we're building this for a stereoscopic, so we can kind of factor this into the preset, you know. You get the idea. Any questions here? What's up, Kyle? Bubble Kano, how are you doing? All right, and we're going to call this SFVR and click OK. All right. So now let's take our Golden Gate Bridge footage. All right. Drag it in here. We like to label these. We'll make this one mango. And then I'm going to take my ambisonic audio. And notice, if you look down in the mix, uh, in the tracks here, these are adaptive tracks. And this four is telling us that this is, they're, they're going to a four channel output. Again, we can verify this simply by opening up our track mixer, where you can very clearly see one, two, three, four, four channels there. Okay? All right. So let's take the ambisonic file, drag that down into the timeline now. And now when I expand this, as promised, and let's just give it a different label color, maybe rose, all right? So as mentioned, you can see that it comes in as one uh, interleaved audio file, meaning that all the channels are together in one file. As I told you with that particular Zoom recorder, Channel three is blank. That's not a that's not a bug. That's not an error. That's not an that is by design with that device. Okay, many different devices actually capture that same way because they don't have the top mic, and that's why you're seeing that. Okay, um, and then even though this is an ambisonic file, right click, synchronize, audio, and it does it. Okay. So again, the synchronization process, all the basics are the same. The only difference is we're just working in 360 here. All right, drag all this stuff over. Again, I typically will mute the camera audio because we've got the ambisonic soundtrack here. Okay, and now we can go into our VR viewer. Oh, and by the way, it's worth pointing out because again, now this is, this is 4K. Um, I'm viewing this in one eighth res if I go to full, yeah, I mean, it's actually playing for me, which is pretty awesome. Don't jump over that. All right. And you can see our, our multi-channel metering down here. Okay. All right. So that's the basics. Those are the basics of creating a sequence with monoscopic stereo content or monoscopic with ambisonic or stereoscopic with ambisonic, okay? Uh, let's see if we've got any questions here. No major questions. All right, hold on. I'm just going to switch over to the other channels and see if we've got any inquiries there. Jai Solanki. Yes. It's hard understanding for new user. Yes, I mean, there's... Oh, it is the Zoom H2N. Thank you, Oz. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of detail in this, which is why, again, I'm breaking this down by the, the most basic fundamentals here. So uh, we're going we're gonna to cover all of these simple basics, and then we'll transition next time into some of the heavier. <laughs> this is the easy stuff. It gets way, uh, way heavier there. Okay. Uh, Luca Unlimited. Maybe a newbie question, but when do I need this over-under mode? So it's not that you need it. If your 360 camera shoots stereo, 3D stereoscopic VR, it will likely shoot in over, under, or side by side. So it's not a it's not a matter of needing it. It's based on the camera type that you have. All right. Oh, and I see Oz already answered that too. All right. 
And he said, why should I render it in stereoscopic? I mean, where would I view it? All my devices work with mono. So again, if, if, you, if you had a headset, you would view it there. You can still deliver 360 stereo to YouTube as stereo, but you need glasses at a minimum uh, to be able to view it. Okay, but you're only gonna you're only gonna deliver stereoscopic if you know people are really able to view it that way. Personally, I'm not a fan of stereo nor 3D in any flavor. It makes me very nauseous. So that's not something I personally do, which is why I got a monoscopic camera. But you know, it just depends what you're doing. All right. Okay. So let's go back to Premiere. Okay. So. I want to get into some audio stuff before we get into some video specific effects, okay? Because the most common thing that I hear when people are working with 360 audio, number of things. One, well, maybe maybe we should come back to the audio. I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with this in terms of starting time. Uh, what do I want to do? Should we want should we do audio first? Do audio first or do video first? Uh, I'm so conflicted. All right, we're going to do audio first. Ken, off topic, haven't used audio sync before. Does it deal with slippage? Ken Colley, so the short answer is if you're talking about if you have like slip from either sample rate, um, changes over time or any, any kind of changes over time, no, it's not doing any stretching at all. Now, if you need a synchronization tool that's going to synchronize while also theoretically dynamically stretching to fit time. I believe Pluralize does that. I think they do that. Uh, we don't. There's no, there's no stretching here. So we're looking for commonalities or markers or whatever. We find those, we line them up. If there's drift, it probably won't auto-synchronize anyway. Um, I've experienced that myself. So no, it doesn't. Now you can manually adjust some of that in Audition because we do have these real-time time stretch handles. So it's possible, not easy, but possible that if there's minimal drift and if it's consistent, that you could realign something and re-render and then synchronize. Um, but yeah, without, without having some kind of uh, time code to lock something into, mm, gonna be difficult going to be a challenge. You know, and if it's if it's something as simple as it was recorded at 44.1, but you bring it into a 48K session, there's a consistent drift, that can definitely be fixed just by changing the sample rate, actually. And then maybe maybe you still have to do a little um, stretch manipulation. It just, it just depends. But anyway, hope that answers your question. Okay, so we're just going to talk real quickly about repositioning of audio, and then we'll talk about three main things regarding video, changing your starting position, um, VR transitions and some VR effects, and then we'll send you on your way. All right. So if you don't have a headset, meaning a VR headset, but you have an ambisonic soundtrack, meaning you've captured spatial audio, of course, you want to be able to experience what that's going to sound like, right? Makes sense. So to do that, we need to effectively turn that four channel spatial audio into what's called a binaural soundtrack. Now, binaural audio has been around for, for decades. I even studied this uh, at college and it, and it originated, the concept was, and you can still purchase these things. They, they look like mannequin heads and they have these two very intense high-end condenser microphones in the ear canal. And the concept behind it was is that it captures a spatial pseudo 360 kind of sound based on the way that the human head hears. And it only requires stereo. So <clears throat> that is effectively when you create VR content with an ambisonic spatial soundtrack, you're not hearing four channels on YouTube, you're hearing stereo. You're hearing encoded, binauralized stereo, okay? Well, in order to preview that, even in just standard stereo headphones, here in Premiere, if you go into the Premiere Mixer, all right, so we're going to twirl down the effects section and then on the master fader, very important that you remember this, on the master fader, if we click on the down arrow, the flyout menu here, and we go into special, the first 
effect in here is called binauralizer ambisonics. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn that on. So now what this will do is that when you're listening back, now again, if you don't have a proper VR headset, when you move the video around, the, 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 bin the ambisonic soundtrack is not moving with it unless you have a VR headset, okay? That doesn't mean that you're not repositioning some of that audio though, okay? So I'm gonna put this on just so I can kind of hear what it's doing and I'll show you how you can also manipulate positions of things, okay? All right, okay. So when you have the binauralizer on, I'm just gonna play this back. Now this is nothing special, it's just like ambient sound, all right? Okay, first of all, you see that it's showing audio on two meters. And that's by design, okay? That's, that's meant to be that way, all right? Now, what happens in here is that if you need to make a global adjustment to the pan, tilt, or roll, all right? So maybe you need to kind maybe you had the microphone backwards, so the audio is flipped and you need to rotate it around itself based on the starting position of your video, and by the way, this is our starting position. We're gonna to get to this in a second, how to change that. But your binaural audio, by default, it starts in that position, looking in that way, all right? And you know what? I'm gonna change this back to wide because now that view, the square views just bother me. And I'm also gonna turn off those controls. Just get those off of there. I think we're losing so much detail, okay. Um, the binauralizer now is going to allow you to hear that. And if you need to make adjustments, all right, you could do that with the pan control right here, all right? Now, again, if you're in headphones, you're gonna get this really weird sensation. It's not just a stereo pan, all right? Pretty cool, all right? Also the tilt. You can feel it kind of, all right, and the roll. A little puke inducing, be careful. So when you're monitoring as you're editing, you want this to be on binauralizer. Now, something to not forget, when you go to render this, you must take this effect off or disable it, okay? You can't render this with the binauralizer because what's gonna happen is, by default, when you export this as VR, it's taking that soundtrack and it's going to binaural, it's going to, in the encoding process, encode that for binaural output. If you already have the binauralizer on there, it's, go, I don't, it's going to mess it up. It's not gonna be what you want. So you have to take that off before you render, right? It's a preview function, okay? All right, now, what if you need to manipulate the position of the audio itself, right? So. It's fine, except I had the microphone back to front. So what I'm seeing as I look forward, I'm actually hearing those people behind me. So I need to like rotate the whole thing. All right, again, we're gonna go up to the track mixer, special, and you'll notice the second to last effect under the special menu is panner ambisonics, okay? And what this allows you to do with both ambisonic content and even mono or stereo content, I repeat that, with both ambisonic content as well as mono or stereo content, is it's going to allow you to do the same thing. You're gonna be able to adjust the pan, the tilt, the roll. So as we play this back now, oh, sorry, I put it on the wrong track here. Oh, well, actually, that's perfect. That's, that's the stereo camera audio. That's even better, all right? So we're, we're listening to this now, all right? As I do that, and you can kind of take note of the meters here, all right? You can see that as I adjust the pan control here, oh, you can't really see it because my camera's in the way. Let me get rid of this. All right. As I make adjustments, I'm feeding that audio into different channels. All right. Maybe go into the tilt. Now remember, it wasn't capturing anything on channel three from above, but now as I tilt up and down, I'm able to send some of that audio to that top channel, okay? I can adjust the relative position or the role of it, okay? So again, I can adjust 
the relative start position of where that can be through those controls right here, even on mono or stereo audio. So let's say you're doing something, again, you've got a static 360 shot, but you want like this music to be behind you, over there. It wasn't actually playing in the scene, but when you turn around, you want the music to feel like it's coming from behind there. You could take your favorite audio track, stick it in there, use the ambisonic panner, and place it behind you, okay? So you can do all kinds of cool relative positioning. Now, a really common thing that people ask is, what if I want the the VOG, the voice of the voice of God thing, where it's emula it's emanating out of all speakers? So the short answer to that is, um, it's eh, well, well, one that isn't kind of how ambisonic audio works, right? It's meant to be spatial and kind of positional in a, in a very discreet kind of way. So really, if you think about it, there's no way to have total sound from all axes unless you had multiple sources blaring it in all directions simultaneously. So while there are ways to kind of fake that, the other thing to consider is that, again, unless you actually have it blasting at you from all directions, top, bottom, front, and all around you, you know, again, as you move your head and look around the scene or walk through the scene, the position changes. You'd have to have someone shouting and speaking at you while being attached to you <laughs> for that to really work. So you can't really do that exactly. Now, if you're using a stereo soundtrack, of course, you're only dealing in stereo, so you don't have the, the spatial nature of it. It's a little bit harder to create that, that VOG, you know, uh, type of voice. It's usually people wanting to do a voiceover where it's, now you can, things can be centered, but again, where's the center? What is center in 360? Like the middle of your head, right? So it's, and as you turn and move, it relatively changes. So if you are trying to do this, it's difficult and it can't, you can, it can sort of do it, but it's, it's not gonna be exactly what you want. If you really want, focused, centered voiceover with 360 visuals, do it as a stereo soundtrack. You're very quiet in the chat today. Unless I'm just not seeing any. Okay. All right, let's go back to my camera view here. All right, so that's the ambisonic panner and the binauralizer, again, to be used specifically for previewing of the, uh, of the ambisonic soundtrack. All right, last couple things I wanna show you here. So let's move over to uh, some 6K footage. So first is how do you change the orientation point or the starting point uh, of your VR content? So this is some stuff that was shot in Venice. Super beautiful footage. Again, I forget what camera this was. This was done about two years ago or three years ago, so forgive me, got some creepy creepiness going on right about there. Um, this is probably one of the few times where actually I need the, I need the controls on so that I know, <laughs> I know where the starting point is. Okay, so this is the starting point. This is how this was shot. So when you upload this anywhere, this is how the video begins on someone's device, all right, or in their headset. Well, let's say you didn't want that. Let's say you actually wanted to start looking off to the side like that. How do you do that? How do you change the orientation or the starting position of the VR video? So we're gonna go up to the effects menu and we're gonna type VR. And under VR, you'll see that there are video effects and video transitions. The one that we want is called VR Rotate Sphere. And this is going to allow you to, again, change the orientation, change the starting point that first position where the viewer sees of what that video is. Let's go ahead and drag that onto our clip and go into effects controls. And when you do that, you'll see that there's three basic uh, parameters that you can modify. Tilt, x-axis, pan, y-axis, roll, z-axis, all right? And just like that, if I go to my pan, all right, and I control this, let's say about 80 degrees, all right? That is now my starting point. So notice, zero, zero, right? 
This was it before, zero, zero. We've now, re we've now readjusted the zero point, okay? So if you want to change the orientation point, the effect you want is VR rotate sphere, okay? Now, that doesn't mean you can't move. Of course, you can still move around. What that means is, again, when you edit and upload your video to YouTube or wherever, when it, the, even the still frame, what people will see, this is the first thing they're going to see, okay? Because that's where the VR video starts. Remember, if they don't drag it, you know, pinch it, move, wearing a headset, if they don't do anything, that's what you're going to see, okay? So that's the VR rotate sphere effect. All right. Now, let's talk about another effect in here. What if you want to integrate titles and things or text in 360 space? Well, of course you can do that. And you can see I've got a little Mogurt here that I made. Um, and I want to basically attach this or have this kind of sitting on the wall as we're, as we're floating by in this gondola, all right? So when I go into the VR viewer, all right, first of all, you can see that it, it looks kind of bent and obviously I need to change the position. So again, now um, I don't have to change the starting position of this video, but I could if I wanted to, but let's go ahead and move over like this. And let's select our graphic, go into effects controls. And I'm just gonna do the basic, whoops, the basic position controls, okay? So I can kind of slide this into view and you can see that it's, it's moving in kind of a 360 way. It's still pretty bent and it, it doesn't, I mean, it never really kind of sits in the scene. And the reason for that is that this is still working kind of on a plane, but now it's we've thrown a two-dimensional flat graphic into this spherical world. So we need to convert this into a spherical Mogurt. So again, if you noticed, up at effects, we have something here called plane to sphere. So when I take this effect and drag it on the graphic, now you can see, first and foremost, okay, it shrinks, but like now it's it's the correct size. It does it's not weirdly bent, right? It appears exactly how and as it should. All right. Let's just go to the uh, go to the beginning of this clip here. There we go. Okay. So now when I go into effects controls under VR plane to sphere, again we've got a couple of things here. So we've got scale. So of course we can scale this up or down. All right, and it scales in that Z space, right? It's actually more than that though. It's in Z spherical space, okay? So I can scale it. I can use a blend mode. So let's say I wanna like overlay this onto the brick, okay? And then I have, I have some stereo disparity options here. So again, if this were stereoscopic, we could arrange how 3D this looks sitting on the brick wall there. And then I have rotate source and rotate projection options. So again, if I needed to, let's, let's, uh, let's reset our original position here. All right, so that, that's, that's, where it, that's where it started, okay? So I'm redoing the original changes that I made here. And let's use the projection panner, all right? So now we've actually repositioned this in the correct way uh, using the rotate projection effect, okay? Now, what that also means, of course, now, is that that stays in that relative position. And as I move in that 360 space, I don't know why this is, there we go, just like taking a second here, um, you can see that it functions just, just like we'd expect it to. Now, I can also keyframe this so that, because this isn't, pinned to the wall, it's just pinned to that relative position. So remember, this is the starting point of our video right here, right? So I'd have to turn my head and go, oh, there it is, all right? It's kind of living over there. Now, if I wanted that to actually stay pinned to the wall in relative position, I could keyframe that as well. Notice all of these are keyframable parameters. But we're just trying to put this in relative position. I mean, you see this in a lot of especially earlier VR productions, kind of got float up, popped up things. They're not really pinned to a surface, but they're pinned to that relative orientation. 
So that's how you do that real simply, all right? Very, very easily. Colby Kleitz. Dang, this is a cool topic. I've got a 360 video camera, so I need to rewatch from the beginning. Oh, yeah, cool. Nice. All right. Audio positioning, Cal. Nice. Okay, sweet. You could make VR illustrations that you could turn into footage and then add audio. Yes. By the way, um, you can also take 360 stills and bring them in here and use and manipulate and keyframe them to create motion on 360 stills. Same thing. Uh, in fact, here, let me see if I have, I have one, but I don't know if I'm gonna be able to access it straight away. I used to have it. Oh, there it is. Oh, sweet. Oh, sometimes, sometimes I love myself. Okay. So this is a still, this was taken by Terry, Terry White. Um, I don't remember which camera he used for this. So what's the size of this one here? So let's go ahead and put this in a new sequence. All right, so this is a still shot by Terry, all right? And I can do, I can manipulate it. And if I wanted to add motion and ambisonic audio to simulate this day, I, I'm assuming this is Atlanta or something, um, I could do that. We could totally fake it, even with a still image, all right? So it all kind of works very, very similarly, which is really nice and very convenient as well. Okay, all right, uh, we got about four minutes here. Wait, Acuff, can you track VR and AE? Guessing you can. Yes, absolutely. And again, doesn't really change all that much from the way that you track non-VR content. Um, I may get into tracking on the next time we revisit this on the masterclass. The best tutorials out there are actually from some of our, so all those VR effects that we have came from Metal. You may know Metal. We acquired some of their uh, technologies a couple of years ago. So I would highly recommend looking for the tutorials. They're on Vimeo. They might be on YouTube as well, but M-E-T-T-L-E, -T -T -E, uh, Tracking 360 VR in After Effects. They've got the best tutorials on that. And again, it's, it's basically the same. There's a couple of additional things you need to be aware of and how you need to set up in advance. But yes, you can absolutely use After Effects for tracking, as well as something I'll show the next time, flattening 360. It's also worth pointing out, um, we also support VR 180 in both Premiere and After Effects as well, okay? All right, so let's talk briefly about transitions. So while you might think, well, I can use all my transitions, right, on 360 content. Yes, you can. But again, if they weren't designed for 360, what will typically happen, especially if there's some kind of like graphical type transition, they're not, they're not meant to fill a spherical environment. So you might have weird sort of stitchy looking artifacts in the transition, or it may just not, again, depending upon where you are as it's transitioning, it may not successfully transition parts of the frame in, a, in, the, in the visual way you expect, like with a cross dissolve or something. So we have specific VR transitions, okay? Pretty classic ones here. Uh, not, not, you know, not reinventing the wheel, but just, just nice, okay? So let's show this one here, like light leaks, all right? And I'll kind of illustrate again. When you see this in VR, so I'm just going to transition from one to the other. So this just, again, this looks like a standard standard transition, right? It doesn't look like I did anything fancy there, okay? And you can see, again, same way if I want to e elongate the transition duration, I just, I do it down in the timeline just as I do with standard non- VR transitions, it all, it all works and functions the same way. The difference is, and you can illustrate this when you go into, when you go out of the viewer, watch what happens across the 360 video. So you can see it's actually transitioning, it's actually leveraging all of, that, all of those spherical pixels as part of the transition. So that's the difference. And you can really see that when you do something like Let's go into a blur, all right? So first, let me just show you, if you do like a Gaussian blur, all right, and let's go into our, let's do like 47 pixels of blurriness. We'll go into the VR viewer, all right? Th th there's some, there's like this weird, stitch artifact that's happening. It's not actually in the video. And I can show that to you because if I turn off this blur, 
that black line isn't there. That's happening because we're using a non-VR effect. All right. So if I disable that and I instead use my VR spherical blur, Oh, I don't know why it's not letting me put that back on there again. Let's do this again. Why is it not doing this? It doesn't want to blur this for some reason. What? Oh, I'm wrong one. Sorry. Duh. VR blur. User error. Come back over here. Let's do again 47 pixels of blurriness. All right. And now when we go into the viewer, we don't have that weird that weird artifact. This is also heavy, heavy math here, but you can see there's that black line is not there. So anyway, my friends, that is unfortunately all the time we have for part one of working with VR and Premiere. Stay tuned until next time. Where we'll do part two, more in After Effects. Coming up next, we've got the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge. So thanks so much for watching. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>